So Dr. Pensack has already nicely introduced Pignogenol. There's not much for me to left to, to, to say about this. Pignogenol is prepared from, manufactured from a bark of a tree which only grows in the southwestern part of France. And a botanical needs to be standardized because usually you have seasonal differences. If you, if you harvest, let's say, blueberries and you harvest them two weeks later than in the previous year, you have different constituents. The advantage with the, with the bark of a tree, these trees grow for 50 years anyway, so the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, flavonoids, polyphenols, which we extract, are more or less always the same. But this is a standardized extract to 70% plus minus 5 of procyanogens, which are very large flavonoid molecule, molecules. And specialists, uh, you probably will then question, how does this actually enter the body? And it doesn't. This is a very complex phenomenon. These big flavonoids, procyanogens they are called, are broken up by the gut microflora. The bacteria in our colon breaks them down into the bioactive molecules, which are approximately this size. The composition, this is, everything is open and published in the United States Pharmacopeia, so it is treated like a pharmaceutical, even though it is a completely natural product. So how can we explain why pycnogenol is so helpful for so ma great many diseases? Dr. Pansak has, has mentioned already quite a few of those, but why can, how can we explain this? In principle, pycnogenol works on two types of cells in the body. One's the endothelial cells, lining the arteries and veins, and leukocytes. In both of these cell types, if you have excess oxidative stress, you will have a dysfunction. In case of the endothelial cells, they are unable to produce nitric oxide and you have hypertension going up, platelet activity getting risky, while in leukocytes, you have a pro-inflammatory situation. So uh, a, a low-grade inflammation which harms uh, body cells by producing extra, whoops, extra oxidative stress. Oh, this was a bit too fast. So, these metabolites shown here in green developing from pycnogenol after a human consumption enter the endothelial cells and act as an antioxidant inside these cells. They enter via GLUT1, which is the uh, insulin-independent glucose transporter, so we know all this. We have actually done uh, pharmacokinetic studies. We know how long it takes until the metabolites are in the bloodstream, how long it takes they are washed out with the urine, so we have all... Uh, studies related to safety, bioavailability, and the pharmacokinetics. The metabolites, here you see the metabolite of the procyanidin. It looks completely different than the procyanidin I've shown you before. This is the active principle, and it turns up in the bloodstream four hours after consumption of a tablet pycnogenol. And it stays there for almost 24 hours. So essentially, you could take one tablet a day. You don't need to divide the doses. You can, if you want to, but one or two tablets at the same, taken at the same time will do the job. It potently inhibits matrix metalloproteinases, and that is one of the reasons why it has an effect on collagen protection. It inhibits the, the, the removal of uh, collagen. We have done studies also showing photoprotection. This was done in Tucson, Arizona. They have a lot of sunlight there, of course, but uh, this was done under normal conditions, under UV uh, uh, radiation instruments. I don't need to show you the uh, mechanisms uh, causing damage, but the inflammation, even low-grade inflammation caused by UV light, then starts the leukocytes to produce MMPs, and these matrix metalloproteinases then speed up the aging, the visible aging of our skin long before we have skin cancer or anything more serious. This is an, uh, happens within a few hours after UV radiation. So we did this study in student volunteers in Tucson, Arizona to measure the minimal erythema dosage, the amount, the energy of UV here in millijoule per square centimeter of skin radiated. And at baseline, before they took pycnogenol, it was 21.6 millijoule per square centimeter and after they took pycnogenol, 1.7 milligrams uh, per kilo of body weight, you see it's almost doubled. Of course, they shouldn't argue that you can safely expose yourself to UV light, but it shows you the uh, potency of the anti-inflammatory contribution for saving your skin uh, from UV damage. 
We did a study also on melasma, or sometimes called cloasma, which affects women much, much more often than it does men. And usually, it is, uh, it's, people suspect it's horm uh, hormonal related, because women often have this after give, having uh, given birth to a child, or if they're taking hormonal contraceptives. And of course, these, these uh, overpigmented uh, areas are very disturbing, especially when they are in the face. And there is a study uh, which we've done with relatively low amounts of 75 milligram uh, pycnogenol per day over a four weeks period that these hyperpigmented areas got lighter in color and smaller in size. Though it didn't completely remove it, to be honest, but it's definitely an, an improvement. Of course, there's always a necessity then to argue how does it do this? How does pycnogenol help to reduce the hyperpigmentation? From in vitro studies, that means in laboratory experiments, they found that the uh, tyrosinase, which is an enzyme involved in producing the, the pigments, is inhibited in its activity. And a standard for treatment of uh, hyperpigmentation was usually kojic acid, which was applied topically, but nowadays it's not accepted anymore because it's pretty corrosive. Uh, it is absolutely not pleasant for the person to spread kojic acid every day on the skin. So by taking pycnogenol orally, you can improve. You cannot fully remove. Let's be, let's be faithful here. You cannot completely remove it, but you lighten it in color and you decrease it in size. So let's switch to uh, cardiovascular area. I talked about the fact that pycnogenol has an effect on endothelial cells. This is, of course, dramatically simplified. Th these are supposed to be the endothelial cells, and this is the smooth muscle surrounding the arteries, the other tissue I've just left out because it's just confusing here. So endothelial cells have a lot of uh, regulatory functions, and they autonomously are able to widen an artery when the blood flow is not doing well because they, say they have senses for what they call shear stress. If they experience shear stress, they will produce nitric oxide to themselves, make the blood vessel expand at that part to give way for smoother blood flow. This is a little bit biochemistry, don't worry about this, <laughs> I will cover this very briefly. So, the endothelial nitric oxide synthase is the enzyme producing the nitric oxide, which then tells the muscle to relax. And it can regulate, it can upregulate, and it can downregulate by certain things like endothelin 1. But in response to shear stress, it will produce more nitric oxide to give way. The problem is with high oxidative stress, this enzyme doesn't work properly. It sometimes then is uncoupled and produces more oxidative stress with um, producing more free radicals. The pycnogenal metabolite molecules act locally then as antioxidants and restore normal function of nitric oxide production. This is the biochemical part. Of course, there are the studies then to prove this. And we have done this in pharmacological studies in student volunteers uh, in Japan. I don't know how the situation is in Thailand, but in, uh, in, in many countries, including mine in Germany, we as students were all participating in clinical trials because we needed the money. <laughs> so, uh, but I would not argue to do one of these studies. You see this poor fellow in Japan. He has a cuff around his, uh, around his uh, upper arm, and they investigate the dilatation of the brachial artery by a so-called so platysmograph, which is a little pipe filled with mercury, and when the whole arm expands because the artery uh, widens, you can measure this with a huge number of ampl amplifiers, which you see here. And they injected acetylcholine because it makes the endothelial cell produce more nitric oxide. And they wanted to see what effect does it have, the pycnogenol, uh, on vasodilatation. So compared to the placebo group, where of course you have a vasodilatation, otherwise these people would have real problems, these are healthy students, you see that in these healthy students, the vasodilatation is dramatically better. Even uh, if they're totally healthy, you see an effect on better vasodilatation with pycnogenol. Of course, a student has no reason now to take uh, pycnogenol because his blood flow is good anyway, but 
there are people where the opposite is the case. We did a very expensive study at the uh, cardiology unit at the University of Zurich in Switzerland, which is one of the highest prestigious uh, clinics in Europe. And they investigated the effect of pycnogenol versus placebo in people who previously had a heart attack. Now, of course, it would be unethical to, uh, to treat people who are real at ri uh, still at risk, but these people were not. They were all under excellent medication to ensure that they will not have any future problems. So you see all of them were on aspirin to prevent that they have a thrombosis. You, with the statins, you see that most of them had cholesterol problems. They were taking ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and diuretics for keeping their blood pressure in, in healthy ranges, clopidogrel for the more serious cases. And what they did in the study, they gave these people pycnogenol in addition to their medication or placebo. And this was, oops, this was a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover. So the groups were one in pycnogenol and then switched after two weeks washout to placebo and vice versa. The other group started with placebo and then got pycnogenol. So this is the gold standard of doing clinical trials, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover. And here you see uh, the flow-mediated vasodilatation, taking a cuff, interrupting the blood flow, then opening the cuff, and then you have the shear stress, and then you have the brachial artery expanding. And you see that this is significantly increased while they took pycnogenol, while in placebo group there was no effect. So it works, it, the better blood flow works in healthy people as it does in diseased people. And pycnogenol does have an effect obviously then on blood pressure. If you support better vasodilatation, there's more space for the blood to flow, the pressure goes down. And this was a study uh, with a relatively high dosage. Uh, these were 200 women in Taiwan, uh, actually done for testing menopausal symptoms, which uh, were lowered by the way. They measured the blood pressure, and with 116 over 72, these women had really, really healthy blood pressure. But nonetheless, you see that with the pycnogenol group, there was a reduction of blood pressure. Of course, we did studies, which is more interesting to see if pycnogenol helps people who have hypertension, because they would then really contribute uh, and I'll contribute, uh, take advantage of uh, taking pycnogenol. So these people were taking, this was a study in, uh, in, in the US, who were taking ACE inhibitors to keep their blood pressure in check. And they wanted to know, can they lower the medication dosage while they are on pycnogenol? And this was the case. 58% of the patients could lower the ACE inhibitors because they took pycnogenol. There are, of course, some patients who had to take the same dosage as before. So this is a very individual situation. Some patients will benefit, others may not. We did another study uh, with patients who were taking nifedipine. They were taking five milligram capsules, uh, four of them a day, and the target was to keep their blood pressure, oops, no, to keep their blood pressure below systolic 130. And in intervals, so they added pycnogenol to the nifedipine, and in intervals of, uh, of two weeks, they tried to remove one of the nifedipine tablets to see if their blood pressure is still doing fine. So at the end of the study, you see that 21% of the patients had to continue with the four tablets of uh, nifedipine, while more than half only required two, and 22% could got away with three. So you have an effect for patients who are taking medication where you would have the desire to reduce the dosage. If people taking nifedipine all the time, they have very common swollen legs. Uh, there's a lot of uh, such unpleasant side effects. AC inhibitors too, but nifedipine is particularly uh, well known for swellings. Uh, giving them uh, pycnogenol may help, but not in all cases. We have to be cautious that there are always some people who will not.